Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 24 through 58. Matthew chapter 13, as we're continuing our verse-by-verse study through the New Testament, beginning with verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Well, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Well, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till all was leaven. Now all these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables. Without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, Well, he who sows good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he has found one of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of this age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the just, Cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. (laughs) Like they did. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. 
And so again, the message is entitled, Do You Understand? As we read through that, did you get it all? Did you understand it all? Well, back in the beginning of chapter 13, Jesus began teaching the people in what are called parables. And as I mentioned last week, a parable is not two male cows, a pair of bulls. And if you want to make your pastor happy, you should laugh louder. Thank you. Thank you. I feel much better. Shall we close in prayer? (laughs) So, not two male cows, but a parable is a story about an earthly occurrence that has an underlying spiritual application. In the first parable, Jesus taught about the sower who went out and sowed seed that fell on four types of soil. Number one, the hard path, then the stony ground, then the weed bed, and then finally the good soil. It was the same farmer. It was the same seed. But there were four different types of soil that resulted in four different results, only one of which was fruitful. Well, after telling the story, the crowds then went away. But the disciples came to Jesus asking him to explain the spiritual significance of this story of the sower and the seed. Now, Mark also records this in his gospel, and he adds this. He said to them, do you not understand this parable, the one of the sower and the seed? How then will you understand all the parables? So, understanding the key elements of this particular parable will help us to properly interpret the other parables, the original meaning that Jesus intended. Now, as Jesus explained to the disciples, the hard path represented those who are hard-hearted to the Bible. And then the birds of the air represent Satan, who swoops down upon those who are hard-hearted and snatches the seed away before it can take root and do anything in their lives. The stony ground are those who are shallow, immature people. They initially seem on fire for God, but then when trials and persecution arises, when, when hard times come, they, they, they fall away because they have no depth in themselves. And then thirdly, the thorny ground or the weed bed are those who are concerned with the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, And the desire for other things, not necessarily bad things, but just other things. They have a lot of hobbies. They have a lot of interests. They have, you know, a lot of other things going on. They just don't have time really to spend before the Lord. And those cares, the deceitfulness of riches, desires for other things just chokes out the word. And they become unfruitful. Finally, the fourth type of soil, the good soil, which I trust is all of us here this morning are those who hear the word of God, we understand it, we apply it to our lives, and it takes root, and it grows, and it produces much good fruit. So these are some keys that will help us in understanding the other parables that we just read a moment ago. Let's continue on with these parables and see what Jesus has to say to us. First of all, in verses 24 through 30, he tells us the parable of the wheat And the tares, by the way, tares is another word for a type of weed that looks initially like wheat, but then later on as it grows, it shows that it's a weed, a tare, and it does not produce anything useful. Verse 24, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came. And sowed tares among the wheat and went his way, which, may I add, is not very nice to do that to somebody. What a, what a bummer that would be. You, you, you work on your garden, you till it up, you, you have your soil amendments, you add, I mean, we had this clay out here that's impossible really to grow stuff in. So you add peat moss and sand and loam and some other things that I've read about. And you you get your soil right and you plant your seeds and then your next door neighbor who for whatever reason doesn't like you much in the middle of the night comes over and he throws some crabgrass seeds down in your your flower beds, in your vegetable garden. That wouldn't be nice, would it? Well, that's what Jesus is saying is happening here. And so when the grain had sprouted, verse 26, 
and produced a crop. Then the tares also appeared. Now the servants of the owner came and said to him, Well, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Well, do you want us then to go and gather them up, those tares? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now later on, Jesus will explain the meaning of this particular parable in verses 36 to 43, and we'll look at it when we get there. So let's move on to the next parable, the parable of the mustard seed, verses 31 and 32. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least or the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So he talks about a mustard seed and... Or is the one before it? No, I missed it. Okay. A mustard seed is incredibly tiny. Incredibly tiny. Now, this is a, a, a row of mustard plants. Mustard plants grow roughly to an average height of about three feet. A lot larger than other herbs that you may have in your herb garden. It's one of the smallest seeds, but it produces the largest plant. But mustard seeds do not grow into trees. They do not grow into trees. And so when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, now I read recently, and it makes sense, a commentator said, sometimes Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, and sometimes he says kingdom of God. And as you look at the passages where he speaks of kingdom of heaven, you can assume that what he's talking about is the Lord ministering to us, his church, and and through us, his people on earth. But then when he talks about the kingdom of God, he's speaking of, of heaven itself. When you see the phrase kingdom of God, the only thing that is mentioned is is the perfection of it. However, when he mentions the kingdom of heaven, we see problems like we see here. The kingdom of heaven, the Lord's rule and reign in us on the earth, like a mustard seed, began very, very, very small. Twelve disciples. One of them was a devil, as Jesus said, Judas who went and hanged himself. But through those eleven men, and then later on God added the apostle Paul, through those twelve men, what began as a small teeny seed has indeed grown into what really would be compared to a huge Tree. This speaks of mutant growth, growth way beyond normal expectations. You know, like when you see a, a, a basketball player on TV, mutant growth. People aren't supposed to be that tall, that big. The football players also as well. And so Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven will begin small, but it will become huge. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, we want the kingdom of of heaven. We want the Lord's rule and reign in us and through us to, to reach out into all the world. That's great. But then he says, in that huge state, the birds of the air will come and nest in its branches. The birds of the air. Now, what does that remind us of when he speaks of the birds of the air? What do the birds of the air represent? What do they represent in the sower and the seed? That the seed represents the devil. That's right. The sower sows the seed. Some seed fell upon the hard path. The birds of the air came and snatched it away. Jesus said later on, the birds of the air represent the devil who snatches the seed out of his heart. Well, if Jesus said, if, if you understand this parable, you will understand the other parables. Therefore, we take the meaning of that first parable, that the birds represent Satan. We apply it to this parable and we go, uh-oh. Does that mean that Jesus is indicating that Satan is going to find a place to nest in the branches of the mutantly grown church? And that is indeed what Jesus is saying. And if you know anything about church history, 
we see that this has been borne out. Initially, the Roman emperors persecuted the early church, causing it to spread throughout the whole world as people fled for their Christians fleeing for their lives. And then churches popping up everywhere. But as time went on, there was one emperor by the name of Constantine who declared that Christianity was the religion of the state. He married the church and the state, an unholy, ungodly union. Whenever the government and the church get in bed together, it produces an evil, evil offspring. And that's what happened. Constantine declared that the Christianity was a religion of the state, and as a result, Satan came and nested in its branches. As time went on, the church out of Rome committed murderous atrocities against all that they felt threatened by, including untold millions of Christians who believed the Bible, who questioned the hierarchy of the church. The popes and the bishops and all began a murderous spree trying to rid the land of anybody who believed that the Bible was the word of God and rejected the words of the Holy Catholic Church. And by the way, it's not just the Catholics in the Dark Ages. But even in recent history, in the Protestant churches, there have been many sad instances, horrific instances of abuse, sexual perversion, even in the pulpit. Awful things taking place within the church. Satan truly has, unfortunately, had his way many times in the church. Which is all to say that the parable of the mustard seed is not a pleasant picture of church history. Not a pleasant picture of of church growth. Jesus is being honest, is he not? How the birds of the air would nest in in its branches. Well, as much as the church will let him, may I add. If we won't let him, he can't nest. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And if we say no to the devil, not just here Sunday morning, but every day, then Satan cannot nest in what the Lord is doing here. Verse 33, the parable of the leaven. Leaven, also called yeast. You know that wonderful wonder bread? It's named Wonder Bread. You know why? Because we wonder if it really is bread, you know? (laughs) And so you you get that Wonder Bread, and it's really fluffy and airy and all, and, you know, my kids love it. And they even sometimes cut the crusts off. I'm like, really? You know? That might be the only thing about that bread that might be of any value. One one man said, the whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. So I just want (laughs) to... throw that out there to you for you to consider when you're walking down the bread aisle. Ooh, it's soft and squishy. Why does it get soft and squishy? Well, because of yeast, because of leaven. Now, leaven is, begins as a piece of rotten dough. It's, it's dough that begins to rot and ferment and letting off gases and all. And you take a starter, a piece of leaven, you, you put it in unleavened dough, and eventually that rottenness that putrefaction, that, that gaseous process begins to infest that lump. Yeah, I can't wait for a sandwich later on, can we? Yeah. I'm going to Lenny's. Now, get the lettuce wrap. So, you get, and, and then it, it rises and it becomes what it is. And you kill the rising process by sticking it in the oven. And so, leaven in Scripture is a very graphic picture of sin. You let a little bit of sin in, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, our lives are not, you know, piecemeal and compartmentalized to where, well, that's just the one little thing I do, but the rest of me is good. No, no, no. Whatever is a piece is of the whole. And so here we have the parable of the leaven. Let's look at it. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till all was leavened. Now, three measures of meal. Three, three, why three? Well, 
This is a suggestion. I'm not saying I know for sure, but here's a suggestion. Some view the three measures of meal as symbolic of the three eras of church history. First, there was the persecuted church, the early church. Secondly, the dark ages, beginning with, as I mentioned, Emperor Constantine. And then after that, the Reformation era, which continues until our day. Therefore, the Lord is saying that leaven, yeast, would permeate the entire church history. Even in the early church, you remember in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, bless their hearts, you remember? Everybody was was trying to see if a communal communist even style of, of living would work. Everybody sold all their goods and then gave the money to the disciples and they distributed as anybody had need and Ananias and Sapphira sold a, a piece of land. But they kept back part of the proceeds, which was fine. You know, if God blesses you with land or, or a possession and you sell it, you can do whatever you want with the money. But don't tell others that you're giving all when you're only giving some. Or that you're giving all when you're only giving even most. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira did. So Ananias, his wife was not there. He comes bebopping in and he says, here you go, Peter and the disciples. Money for the land that we sold. And Peter looked at it and maybe he knew a little bit about real estate. He's like, oh, something's not right here. Figures don't line up. Is this all you got for that land? Oh, yeah, that's everything. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, How is it that you have decided to lie, not to man, but to God? And then the Lord, at that moment, killed Ananias on the spot. He dropped down dead. And then the young man came and carried him out and went and buried him. Well, his wife didn't know. Sapphira, she didn't know a thing about this. She comes bebopping in later on. And Peter says, Hey, Sapphira, i got a question for you. Uh, did you sell the land for, for this amount? And, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we sold the land for. And... He said, you know what? You too have lied not to men, but to God, to the Holy Spirit. And behold, the feet of the men who just buried their husband are going to come here and bury you now. And she drops down dead right there and then. Leaven in the church that God purged immediately. Now, if God kept purging leaven like that, I don't know how many seats would be filled here this morning. I don't know. I, well, I know. You'd, you'd have a different pastor. Because who here has been sinless since the day they received Jesus as their Savior and Lord? Any liars want to raise their hands? <laughs> Bunch of leaven, yeast, wonder bread. Jesus clearly tells us that leaven is a, is a symbol of sin and evil. Mark 16, verse 12, then as he was speaking to the disciples, he told them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And he said, they did not under, or excuse me, they, then they understood. He did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The leavening doctrine of them, which was do good works, be righteous, and God will accept you. Just be good people and God will let you into heaven. That's a leaven, leavenous doctrine because it's wrong. It's evil. The only way into heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. Also in Mark chapter 8 verse 15, then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Herod was the king of the region. The leaven of the self-righteous Pharisees coupling with the leaven of Herod, there you have the unholy union of the church and the state. I, bear with me for a second when I say I believe in the separation of church and state. I firmly believe in it. Here's what I mean. I don't want the state sticking its nose in the church's business. I want them to stay out of the church. Now, they interpret it the wrong way. They think separation of church and state, which was just something in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a group of Baptist believers. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in any formal acknowledged document. 
It was simply a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a group of Baptists saying, you know, don't worry, there is no state-run church. We're not going to be like England. There will always be a separation of church and state. You do not need to worry about us imposing our government upon the church. That's what it was originally meant to be, not what we see today. Beware of the leaven. You know, beware of, of, of ministers who court the politicians and politicians who court ministers. You know, beware of that. Those who seem to have it in well with, with uh, governmental administration, ministers who are in league with them, take heed, beware of that leaven. Also in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Saying one thing, but yet being another. So in the parable of the leaven, Jesus is warning us about how the church would become corrupted with three things. Rotten doctrines, unholy alliances, and self-righteous hypocrisy. Again, not a pretty picture, is it? Not a pretty picture. Now, in verses 34 and 35, Jesus' parables were prophetic, prophecy. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Here, the Holy Spirit through Matthew is quoting from Psalm 78, Verse 2, the penman of which was a man named Asaph. The Holy Spirit through Asaph writing this in the Psalms, which was a prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, which was indeed fulfilled by Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, there are over 350 specific prophecies of who the Messiah would be, what he would do in his first coming. Jesus fulfilled every last one of them. No one has come close to fulfilling even a small handful of them, let alone all of them, other than Jesus Christ. Someday, maybe we'll discuss the random chance probabilities. They're so astronomical. In anybody just accidentally fulfilling eight or ten of them in his or her lifetime. It's impossible to be born of the tribe of Judah in the city of Bethlehem, uh, in the family of David, uh, and, and, and then to be crucified and to have his garments divided among them and for his clothing they would cast lots and he would be offered sour wine and on, uh, while he was hanging on the cross. Who other than of Jesus do these few prophecies speak of? There's nobody else in history, human history, that has fulfilled all of those, things that were totally beyond Jesus' control. And one of the prophecies in the Old Testament was that when the Messiah comes, he would speak in parabolic form, speaking parables, which he is, is doing here. Here's the deal. Since Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies concerning his first coming, it's safe to assume he's going to fulfill the last few remaining prophecies in his second coming. He's coming again. And my question for us this morning is this. Are you ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Do you know that you know that you know. If you don't know, after the service come forward, people would love to pray with you. In verses 36 through 43, Jesus explains the parable of the tares, how the master sowed good seed, but the enemy came in the night and sowed tares, sowed weeds among the wheat. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. You know, last week we read that the multitudes didn't understand what Jesus meant. But they simply, after he, they heard the story, they, they went their way. But the disciples who came to Jesus got to understand because they asked Jesus, will you explain it to us? Of course, which Jesus did. And it made the point that the Lord says, whoever asks, receive. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door shall be open to them. The Lord wants to answer all your questions. If you don't understand the scriptures, if you don't understand what the Lord might mean in his word, there are answers out there, but 
The Lord's not going to chase you down and, and say, wait, 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 let me explain this to you. No, 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 no. You go chase him down. You go ask him, Lord, what did you mean by this? I'm sure you might know some, some godly people, some people with, with some Bible knowledge. Give them a call. Ask them. Put them on the spot. See if they know. You know, I might not have all the answers, but I got this really cool Bible study program on my computer. I can look it up. And so should you have any questions, we can search together. Be, be more than happy to do so. Anybody has a Bible question, let's, let's search it out. But don't be like the multitudes who are like, wow, that's a cool story. See ya, got to go and, you know, watch the game later on. Got to run away. No, no. You go chase Jesus down and you'll find him. And he'll give you the answer. He'll give you the answer. So the multitudes go away. And the disciples, now will you explain to us what you meant by this? You know, the word disciple means one who learns. So really, any of us can be a disciple in that sense of the word. One who, I want to learn, want to know more. Do you want to know more? We sang that song, we are hungry. We are hungry for more of you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. So explain this to us. Verse 37, he answered and said to them, well, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. It's a title that is used in the Old Testament, referring to the coming of the Messiah. Jesus used this title of himself, the son of man. The field is the world. So later on, when we read about a field in another parable, we can trans or or we can understand that that means the world. Field equals the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The wheat that bears fruit, bears grain, true believers. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The weeds, sons of the wicked, fruitless people, wicked one. In the early stage of growth, germination, tares and wheat look a lot alike early on. But later on, when it's time for harvest, the wheat is bent over because they're heavy laden with, with much grain, with, with fruitfulness. Whereas the tares, they remain defiantly upright and rigid, but yet are fruitless. Verse 39, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So the Lord is sowing his good people in the kingdom of heaven, in, in the church, here in the world, and yet also here in the world, the enemy is sowing his people. Enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Now remember in the initial story, the, the reapers, the servants, said to the master, do you want us to root up those tares, pull them out? The master said, no, lest you uproot the wheat with them. Don't tear them up because you may damage the wheat. Practically speaking, in the body of Christ at large, across America, God has his people, but Satan also has his people. There's wheat and there are tares. Tares look like wheat. Those of the enemy look like believers. They act like believers. They may say the same thing that believers say. They speak Christianese. You've heard of Chinese and Japanese. There's Christianese. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Christianese words. Amen. Rock on, God. No, I don't know if that's it, but. So, do you want us to uproot the tares? And the master says no. Now, if the, if the church leadership goes on a tear hunt, you've heard of the Salem witch hunts way back in, in the day. If the leadership goes on a tear hunt and we're going to uproot everybody who we think might be of the devil, they run the risk of damaging the wheat. Because if we find one, we tear them up and you can't be here anymore. You're of the devil. You are fruitless and you are taking up space and valuable resources and you're using up our air conditioning and you are fruitless. Now get out of here. Well, there will be some other believers who see that and they'll think, man, they're harsh. What's up with them? Why are they so angry? I don't know if I want to be at a church like this. This is really bothering me. This is stumbling my faith. And so that's why the master says, no, 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 just leave them alone. 
Leave them alone. Our course of action is do nothing until the Lord at the end of time comes and he himself will separate the wheat from the tares. Now, that's speaking of tares. If somebody is a wolf in sheep's clothing, that's a different story. You know wolves because they snarl, they snap, and they feed on sheep. And so when somebody comes within the church and they are snarling and they're snapping and they're baring their teeth and they're angry and they're preying upon the sheep, that's when, there's, that, that's when we know they are wolves and that's when we take them out back and shoot them. In Christian love, <laughs> but certainly we ask them or we tell them, you're not welcome back here. And if need be, we get a restraining order, which we have done once in our 17 years of church history. And some of you are wondering, who was that? None of your business. <laughs> so, tares, on the other hand, they look like wheat, they sound like wheat, but bottom line is they're, they're not really doing any damage. They're just taking up space and they're not producing fruit. They don't give of their time, talent, or treasure. They're, they appear that they're growing, but they don't really belong to the Lord. Best thing to do is let the Lord deal with the tares in that day. Notice in verse 40, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire... Oh, they will be dealt with. They will be dealt with. So it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. He will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a false doctrine floating around that there is no hell. There is no literal place called hell. Recently, one very popular Christian author wrote that hell is really a state of being. You create your own hell here and now. Man, that guy has no idea what he's talking about. Because Jesus spoke more of hell, the eternal abode, that was originally created for the devil and his angels, not for people. Jesus said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. However, if a person wants a Christless life now, they will have a Christless eternity then. They will join the devil and the demons in what the Bible calls the eternal lake of fire, a place also that Jesus here says wailing and gnashing of teeth. Also, Jesus said a place where their worm does not die. And that's just a kind of a creepy, gross Thing, a, a picture, an image to have in our mind. And I, I, I've seen, this is what I picture in my mind, and my old youth pastor stuff is going to come out now. Had a mouse trap, set it, a few months later came back and found it, and the mouse had been in it for a while. Turned it over, and we'll move on. You get the, get the imagery. Where their worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. It's a real place, a literal place, pain and suffering. It's being in that place of constant torment and pain and almost on the verge of death, yet not able to lose consciousness. Not able to just die. You're just in the constant state of dying. This is a place where all terrors will go. Where those who really don't belong to the Lord, they're going to go there. They will spend eternity there. And it's their own choosing. If you choose, you can become a son of the kingdom, a daughter of the kingdom of God. You can become his adopted son or daughter through, through receiving Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You will then be transformed from a tear into wheat, and you will, you will go forth and produce fruit. God will bless your life, and he will use you for his kingdom. Or a person can remain a tear and face the judgment that is to come. But those who are wheat, those who are truly his people, then the righteous, we've been righteous through faith in Jesus, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. (laughs) 
either we'll shine like the sun or we're going to burn in the furnace. It's about as simple as I can make it. In verses 44 through 45, we have the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. What does the field represent? Do you remember? The world represents the world. Treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, so it's still there in the world. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, Jesus already said the field is the world. In this parable, we see that Jesus gave everything to buy it, the the world. But not for the world itself, but for the treasure that's in that world. Now, let me ask you, what or better, who is the treasure that's in the world? You are. You're the treasure that Jesus gave everything to purchase. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You are the treasure. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he found one of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Here Jesus is that merchant, again, who sold everything to purchase the one pearl of great price. And guess what that one pearl of great price is? You. You. You are the pearl of great price. It's been said, if you were the only one to have ever been born, Jesus still would have come to this earth to die for you. And that's very true. You are the pearl of great price. Let me, let me say, we are not worthy of what the Lord has done but we're not worthless either. You are not worthless. Maybe you feel, oh, I'm just nothing, I'm worthless. No, 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 no. Understand this. Worth or value is determined by what one is willing to pay for it. What has Jesus paid for you? Knowing you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, Jesus didn't use mere money to buy you from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You are of utmost value because of what Jesus paid for you. The next parable is the parable of the dragnet. Who's old like me and remembers what that's all about? Okay. We want just the facts, ma'am, right? Just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. I read a comment that, that the police officers in Dragnet, they were constantly invading people's homes without proper search warrants. If they tried to do that today, they'd be thrown in jail. Side note. The parable of the Dragnet, not the old police show during the 60s, But, verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good, good fish into vessels, but threw the bad away, the stinky sardines. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Bottom line, are you a good fish or a bad fish? And if there's any question in your heart, after the closing song, please come forward. People would love to pray with you. In verses 51 and 52, Jesus asks, Do you understand? Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Now, I highly doubt they understood all these things. But at least they were listening, which is good. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed the kingdom, uh, concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. The treasure here... That's our knowledge and our experiences with the Word of God, the Bible. There is no such thing as new truth. 
In fact, one pastor wisely said, what is true is not new, and what is new is not true. So if you hear of some new doctrine, don't believe it. But certainly there are new experiences with that which has always been true, and that's what we want. That's what we're looking for even this morning, a new experience with that which has always been true. Now, the more we grow in the Lord, the more we stockpile his word into our hearts and those experiences with the old truths. And then as we go along in life, God opens the door for us to share things with people. We bring out of our treasure, out of our households, those treasures, Old experiences with what has been true, new experiences with what has been true. And that's the picture that Jesus wants us to have, that he wants to use us to minister to other people, to bring out of our treasures those things that will be useful for people, to have experiences with that which has always been true. I'm sure if you've known the Lord for any length of time, you can tell stories of what God has done in the far past. And you can tell stories about what God has done in the very recent times. That's bringing out of our treasure things old and things new. Now, finally, in verses 53 through 58, we read that a limited view of Jesus can't be blessed. If we have a limited view of Jesus, we can't be blessed. Verse 53, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, and that would speak of the city of Nazareth, city of Nazareth, we grew up. He taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and, and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Oh, well, actually, no. He's not the carpenter's son because Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. In this, they were wrong. They had a limited view of Jesus. They thought that Jesus was merely a product between one man and one woman, as all of us are. But Jesus is far greater than that. He is the product of a virgin whom God the Father miraculously caused to conceive. The virgin conceived and gave birth to the only begotten Son of God, and that's Jesus Christ. But the hometown crowd did not believe that Jesus was the son of God. They thought he was just the son of Joseph, the carpenter. And that's why they were offended when he came to them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So uh, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Now that is true. His mother, Mary, who at the time of giving birth to Jesus was indeed a virgin. And his brothers, and names the brothers who we know are really half-brothers of Jesus, names them his brother James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Well, actually, those brothers and sisters that they listed were really half-brothers and sisters of Jesus. They all had the same mother, Jesus and these brothers and sisters, and that was Mary. But their father was Joseph, whereas Jesus' father is God. We read in Matthew's gospel that Joseph did not know her or have sexual relations with her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Well, after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary engaged in normal marital relations, and God blessed them abundantly. They had lots of kids. They have, what what does it say, four brothers here? Uh, the, Joseph and Mary had four sons, and they had sisters, plural, so maybe at least two, maybe more. They had at least six kids between the two of them. Jesus, however, the Son of God. So the hometown crowd, again, wrongly assumed that Jesus was the product of Joseph and Mary. They said in verse 56, Where then did this man get all these things? Well, he's God. That's where he got them from. Got them from himself. So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, Now a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Here's what you can do. Try to witness to your close relatives. See how well that goes over. Others may listen to you, but... 
your close non-believing relatives, they know you too well. They know what you were all about way back in the day, and they can't get over it. I've tried to witness to my father when he was alive. Didn't really want to listen. Tried to witness to my mother. She doesn't want to listen. Why? Because they knew me. Yeah, they've seen a change, but they still remember the little holy terror that I was growing up. And so a prophet is, has honor except in his own home. Now, this is really sad. Verse 58. He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Jesus was willing, but due to their limited view of Jesus, he couldn't bless them. They wouldn't come to him. So he couldn't do anything for him. Hey, if you don't come to Jesus, God can't do anything for you. As I mentioned earlier, he's not going to chase you down and force truth upon you. You go to him and he'll give you truth. Well, anything from God, he's not going to chase you down. He opens the door. Whoever comes to me, he says, I will by no means cast out. You come to Jesus and there you will find blessing. But if you're not coming to him, no blessing for you. And if we expand our view of Jesus, knowing that he truly is God eternal, who at one point in time became a human being, took on human flesh. If we expand our view to know that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he is the great physician, he is the wonderful counselor, he is everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness that's found in the knowledge of him. If we will have that view, then we will come to him and then we will be blessed. And this morning, if your view of Jesus is opening and you see your need and you're realizing he is the one who can help you, we invite you too to come forward after the closing song. People will be here to pray with you that God might bless you. God wants to bless you if you come to him. And Father, with that, we do come to you now in Jesus' name. And Lord, each of us has issues, has problems, has uh, situations, Lord, it may be physical, maybe, you know, like me, I have a cold right now and I'm supposed to go to Panama in a couple of days and Lord, I really don't want to have a cold, but your will be done. Would you please touch me and heal me? I pray that you would. Well, some here, Lord, have real problems, big problems, and they absolutely need you. Lord, whether it's a big problem or a small problem, it's nothing for you, for you are above all things. And so, Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would put it on our hearts to seek you early and often to come to you, Lord, and to embrace you and to find blessing in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.